Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Investors should know where the sharp ratio is coming from and what is going to be the expected return in, a, in an equity crisis. So uh, that's critical and needs to be done across multiple time frames, right? So uh, CTAs are a great equity hedge, but today they will not provide protection if it's a relatively you know, uh, quick correction. If it's a two, three week correction, I would say CTAs will have a, a hard time. Nicole, welcome back to the podcast. It's good to have you here. And, and Katie and I are very excited to be having this conversation with you and to get a chance to do it all together here in Miami. Now, it's been another surprising and for some exciting investment year, but also we want to refresh our minds a little bit before we get started with uh, what has happened in between. You were on the podcast a few years ago. So why don't you refresh our minds a little bit about sort of your development firm-wise, maybe a little bit of background to refresh people's mind on, on your own sort of a path into this uh, industry. And then we'll jump into some of the uh, exciting stuff that we can talk about today. So uh, quickly, my background is I started, I studied electrical engineering and uh, went to work for Anderson Consulting. And when I was 21 years old, decided to become a CTA. I had the bad idea of doing that, but uh, so, <laughs> uh, and everything along the way, you know, I, I got an MBA at Columbia, but basically since I was 21, I've been, you know, teaching myself how to design trading systems, uh, reading and uh, trying to speak to different professors. And again, I made the mistake of going to Columbia Business School, which is um, very fundamentally, very equity driven fundamental investing. And uh, basically there I was like a leper and, uh, you know, who knows, like in a nudist colony or something, right. it was not, not the right place to be as a technical uh, trader. Good experience overall. Uh, I did a couple of uh, had a couple of stops before I could actually uh, start the CTA. First, uh, I ran a fund of fund for a couple of years, and I also traded the risk arb for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Finally, in uh, in ninety nine, I had uh, enough investor interest to start the CTA. Most of our history until two thousand ten, uh, we actually managed money. As, uh, we had one investor that had ninety percent capacity rights. Yeah. Uh, uh, they redeemed in two thousand ten, and our assets dropped from about six hundred million all the way down to fifty. So it was uh, from 2010 until 14. It was kind of trying to rebuild the firm. Yeah. In 2014, the firm had about uh, 700 million uh, in assets uh, with about nine people. Between 14 and now, we've grown to about 1.4 billion, and now there's 19 of us. Uh, so we've grown quite substantially, yeah. despite having a very difficult year. So interestingly enough, down at the conference, people say, you know, uh, how did you manage to raise so much money by losing so much? Yeah. So it's been, uh, you know. but don't make it a habit, right? <laughs> it may not always work out that well, but it's been impressive for sure. It's yeah, been a great, yeah. great story to follow, and and it's really good to have you back to sort of follow up on 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 where we uh, left off last time we spoke for yeah. sure, for sure. And Nicole, what are some of the things that you that you've learned along? I mean, you've obviously had a very long path, yeah, and yeah. and it's you know not it's been a long and. Um, interesting path. Yeah, what, yeah. what are some of the things you've learned that you've incorporated into your oh, process? Yeah. I mean, there's so much, uh, there's so many layers of learning. Every time you think you learn something, you think now I have it and you realize there's just many more layers. Technically first, of course. So in terms of, you know, how to do momentum trading, all the different aspects, the different time frames, the different filtering techniques. Uh, and also in such an extreme environment, such as 2017, in terms of uh, where mean reversion was such a, such a strong component uh, in the short term time frames, how to deal with that type of environment, how to deal with investors, how to have a very clear process which is as transparent as possible, 
where despite having, you know, I would say, you know, one of our worst years, actually was our worst year, uh, we were able to, you know, double in size pretty much. So that basically defining your process clearly, uh, isolating the value added where investors know how you're going to perform when they look at the market, at least they have a good sense, is so critical in terms of providing stability to a business. I mean, it's interesting that you say that. Uh, you hear a lot of the sort of the the gurus in in not just in our world, but just sort of the the successful entrepreneurs. They always tell you what you should really learn is to fail well, mm-hmm. and that failure, quote unquote, failure, uh, <laughs> Fail but the difficult well. times, yeah, yeah. are where you learn the most. Yeah, yeah. So, can you translate it and say actually, twenty seventeen was the year you learned the most? Is it that kind of thing? Or you know, I, I've uh, been listening to Ray Dalio's book, and he talks about uh, failure and uh, how he grew out of that. To me, uh, I'm all, I, I'm always feel like I'm in a state of failure. I've right. never feel comfortable. Yeah. The CTA industry is so up and down. It feels like it's a constant. During the growth, there's uh, challenges, and during the difficult period, there's challenges. Uh, but definitely having, to me, although uh, it's very pleasant to be arrogant and confident, unfortunately, I've chosen to try to live in a way where I feel like I know nothing, and I know that what I know today is going to become irrelevant tomorrow, uh, and to build from that platform rather than saying, here's what I know. And critical in the investment process, I would say there's something which is the techniques have been known and there's new techniques, et cetera, et cetera. But really the critical aspect and what comes with a lot of years of investing is understanding your own intuition. It's like you can justify every investment techniques at any different time. You can say this is doing great. You can buy it because there's a bubble in this technique or you can say, you know, buy this because it's underperformed. Uh, at the end, what's really important uh, is evaluating within yourself where that intuition is coming from. So typically, I think we make decisions emotionally, then we justify them intellectually, right? Uh, so evaluating where the decision is coming from has been the most critical aspect, where I would say what I can do today that I couldn't do 20 years ago when I started, where all the techniques that we know, you know, I could teach to somebody, someone who's, you know, relatively competent, but that aspect of the business is much more difficult. I said that's the, the most valuable. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned Ray Dalio, and I recall from our last conversation when I think it was when I asked you if you would tell something or share something that most people didn't know about you. And, and you told me about the fact that you do meditation, yeah, yeah. which is, and I think even the same meditation as Ray Dalio. And so, and he attributes that. At least in the book, because yeah. I've also yeah, yeah. been, been uh, catching up on on his latest book, he attributes actually that to be probably the most important thing that he's done in his career. Are you at the same level when it comes <laughs> to meditation? Meaning that you think that this is so critical, uh, you know, in 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 yeah. in achieving the success that you've achieved. Yeah, uh, uh, no, no. I'm gonna say uh, it seems to be the more I meditate, the better decisions I can make. So when I feel stuck in life, then what I do is choose to do. Like people say, let me do this. I mean, like they become uh, overactive and try to reach. And uh, that for me, the instinct is quite the opposite: mm-hmm. to retract and quiet down and start again. Yeah. And the way to start again and to see the world fresh is to actually do something that your mind is not comfortable doing, or actually take away from it all its toys and. Uh, to make it a little bit uncomfortable. So kind of like erase it or re- uh, kind of like to have a reboot. And, you know, there's daily aspects of meditation. So uh, Ray Dalio does TM. I actually right. started practic- practicing TM only about uh, five years ago, okay. but I started uh, meditation 25 years ago. So uh, for me, like the retreats where you go for, you know, seven days or 10 days and you're sitting in silence and you have no idea what's going to come out of your mind are the most useful because the ideas that come are typically uh, not in line with what you thought <laughs> When you enter, it's only when you quiet your mind down enough that you can allow yourself to hear what something inside you already knows, right? The deeper intuition, which is very, very valuable, which is more difficult to get. So the important aspect of meditation for me is that the different aspects of my mind, of my emotions are not, you identify less with them. You're able to look at them as external things that you can use. I can choose to think this, I can choose to think that. Where before that, I thought my thought and I are one. So I cannot, if I thought something different, then I would, I would lose. I would feel scared of changing my mind. Mm. Uh, with meditation, you're, uh, I'm, I'm willing to look at the upside and downside of every thought or every emotion. Mm. 
then uh, you can go to uh, something which is a little bit deeper where you're aware of where these things are coming from. And then there's little messages in there that tell you whether you're acting out of fear, you're acting out of greed, you're acting out of jealousy, you're acting out of uh, confusion, uh, <laughs> desperation, all these things. Uh, then you have habitual thoughts that come in each one of those thought regimes, let's say. And uh, knowing what thought regime you're in is highly useful. So yes, I'm gonna. Uh, as yeah, a, yeah, that doesn't. <laughs> I'm gonna say definitely that you know, coming from a let's say technically you know slightly above average place, yeah. uh, I think with meditation, I would say anybody can succeed in anything they do because your mind becomes so malleable. Okay. I'm gonna say it's an amazing technique for uh, no matter what is uh, one uh, is looking to achieve. Well, I might. <laughs> If it's that useful, I might consider that. <laughs> I mean, of course, there's the stress of everyday life where we have to process so much information and our nervous systems are not designed to handle that much information. So right, right. Uh, meditation is also very useful in uh, being able to uh, slow down the nervous system that way. Yeah. 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 No, thanks for sharing that. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Nicole, I was thinking, you know, Quest is really, you've been around for quite a while yeah, in yeah, the yeah. space. And recently, as we discussed, you've had quite a lot of growth in, in, in your firm and You know, what do you think, even though we've discussed performance, what are some of the success factors that you have seen that have really helped you to build your business more in the recent years? So one aspect which I landed with is, uh, you know, I grew up in, a, in an unstable third world country, so I've seen instability, and I'm always assuming that the world is unstable. So I'm always looking at the tail events, and I give them much more importance than a typical, uh, I would say, money manager today in the U.S., As a result, I'm always thinking of the tales rather than thinking of the everyday event. And uh, the way that translates into uh, a strategy for Quest is that we've always normalized our returns, not based on volatility or based on market beta, but we've normalized our returns, taking into account tail risk. And that's something which is uh, not typical in today's asset management industry. So in today's world, you can achieve sharp ratios of five if you, you know, go short the VIX, and uh, you can achieve sharp, negative uh, sharp ratios and uh, depending on the market environment. All that is available depending on the level of convexity or tail risk you're willing to expose yourself to. So convexity is basically when you're driving a car, as you're approaching a wall, whether the investment strategy is going to accelerate or, or be able to slow down. A negatively convex strategy are strategies where once you start losing, your loss is going to accelerate. You're not going to, it's typically difficult to get out, such as a short VIX where you're making money almost every day, but then when you lose, you can lose six months, one year, three years, five years of returns. So negatively convex strategies are ones where there's acceleration when you're losing. Positively convex is when uh, there's acceleration on the upside. What we see is that in the same way that there's CAPM with S&P correlation and S&P beta, uh, we use a CAPM which is convexity-based. So we're looking at skew as the driver of alpha and skew as a driver for sharp ratio. Uh, as a result, where a lot of investment managers have gone from aiming for higher sharp ratios by exposing themselves more and more to risk on or more and more to negative tail risk or to being short the tails or being short puts on the S&P type of thing, we've maintained a discipline where the alpha that we're looking to generate to the S&P or to the CTA index has to come with positive convexity always. Where what I'm saying is you can easily increase your sharp ratio or easily increase your alpha to the, to the indices by, going, by shorting tail risk. That's like, I would say that's not a skill-based return or skill-based alpha. Uh, by making that differentiation, we've been able to pick aspects of the market where there's very serious inefficiencies. What percentage of investors today look at the realized convexity in the market? Most people look at realized volatility. That's how they size their positions. We have found that uh, there's ways to effectively, without trading options, go long options <laughs> or basically trade in the direction of potential volatility increases in the market when you measure realized convexity. And that's been extremely valuable. So we've generated very high alphas to the S&P while being long a put at the same time. That's the value of what we've done from a message perspective and from a strategy perspective. I mean, is this something that you can do, but it has to be done in a particular time frame? Because 
obviously what you're explaining, if I'm understanding it correctly, is certainly different to the traditional trend follower who typically dominates the the, the managed futures space. Yeah. So is that why you've also, is that what's leading you to focus also on a particular time frame in uh, order to yes. deliver that? Yes. So in, in general, in, in the past 20 years, the more long term you've been, uh, the less positive convexity you generate. So how have CTAs hedged S&P corrections or equity corrections, mainly from being long fixed income or from trading short term? But effectively trading long term, it'll take you in today's world, let's say the S&P goes down. I know that would be like miraculous, but let's say the S&P <laughs> starts to go down. <laughs> it, it, it would take a long term trend following strategy such as a 300 day moving average, which is, a, you know, call it an 80% correlation Thing to the CTA index, it would take it weeks to reverse from uh, long the S&P and you know, short fixed income to the other way. So let's say the longer term CTAs today have reduced uh, by becoming more long term and adapting to what has worked, they've reduced their ability to uh, hedge S&P corrections. So more short term, more shorts, typically in today's world, give you more positive convexity. Mm -hmm. If you assume fixed income is gone as a you know, negatively correlated asset to the S&P, or, you know, let's say today... At least say, the amplitude of correct. the move will be... Today, yeah. half this, I would say half the fixed income markets are short momentum, right? You know, they look at the five-year, the 10-year. So you're already seeing some uh, some bear markets in fixed income. Or in fixed income. If the S&P goes down, CTAs could potentially lose both on the uh, reversal on the on equities and the reversal on fixed income. Where when you're trading shorter-term time frame, and what we found that the ideal level of... Uh, can, convexity comes up around seven to 10 days per trade, you're able to have more positive convexity and enough returns and enough alpha, or you're not be becoming too sensitive to uh, mean reversion. Right? So, so that seven to uh, 10 time frame is really critical. Just a follow up question. Um, so you mentioned time frames. Yes. Are you also incorporating, the, it seems like you're incorporating this philosophy in pretty much risk management, signal construction, strategy selection. Is there any aspect that you think the most critical? Well, you can do the same thing in your models. You can do it in your risk management. We choose to do it uh, by adding models. Our risk management is, you know, is very, very flat. The way our positions increase is by getting new signals that are diversified from the previous ones. But you could equally uh, say, you know, my models are very simple and my risk management is going to handle this. Mm -hmm. We choose to do it at a system level. But you need to handle it somewhere. <laughs> so when you trade more short term, you have to become more filtered because you become more transaction cost sensitive where you can uh, trade long term and be 100% of the time in the market long or short. The more short term you go, the more selective you have to become in your trades to overcome transaction costs. So you're going from a strategy, you know, long term where your slippage is, you know, 5% of your gross profits to in short term, your slippage is 30, 40, 50% of gross profits. So less continuous signals and Definitely. maybe more sort of pure conviction driving the complexity. Correct. That's complexity. why, especially when you're looking for the accelerations, we're saying you need to jump in before the acceleration comes, type of thing. Of course, you can do this. If, if you're trading mean reversion, you can trade short term very, very easily. We've provided the models in our research that have sharp ratios of three, four, five, just buying the dips in, in financials. So that's very easy. And we provide those models on our website. So, Nagul, I have to admit, I'm a fan of a lot of your white papers. I think I've read them all. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think one of my favorites was the one on long bonds. Mm -hmm. And um, also you had one on equity bias a while ago as well. Yeah. What is one of the most recent and most interesting white papers that you have written? And do you have any in the pipeline that you can <laughs> tell us about? And I'm looking well, forward to read them. <laughs> uh, so, so we haven't written much since, you know, we've been busy kind of uh, digesting the assets that we've raised. But I think the, the next one we will write will be uh, basically creating a CAPM, basically a linear model between sharp ratio and alpha and convexity. And telling investors effectively before you evaluate the sharp ratio on investment, you need to look at the convexity and providing actual uh, linear equations saying, you know, for a sharp ratio, uh, for a convexity of minus two, you should achieve a sharp ratio in this environment of one and a half. And if your manager is not achieving higher than one and a half effectively, you can replicate them. So the next paper will focus on uh, not only that convexity tells you how much you can lose, how many multiples of volatility your drawdown is going to be, 
but you can also predict what the sharp ratio and the alpha to the S&P and to the beta are going to be as well. So we'll, uh, we'll soon write a paper which actually will uh, illustrate that relationship more clearly so that investors are, especially in a world like today where the vol is low and the risk is really in the convexity, not in the volatility, investors can continue to evaluate uh, whether the, the managers they're allocating to, the markets they're allocating to, with that in mind. To us, that's the most important aspect of risk, where risk is uh, overlooked, but also uh, the alpha and the upside are, um, might be, uh, the expectation on those could be, could be misconstrued. So does, does this kind of, I mean, these are technical explanations, and I certainly find in, in my work that if I make it too technical, yeah. I lose people. Yeah. On the other hand, your strategy, your argument, yeah. to me, appears to be it is suited well for a for a technical explanation because you you want to you probably want to appeal to a certain audience yeah. and and be part or, or serve a very specific role in their portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you find that doing these white papers and and making it a very technical argument? Does, does that help you not just raise assets, but also kind of build that relationship during the difficult times with, with investors? And do they understand it? I mean, do, they, <laughs> do you think they understand it? I mean, I'm going to have to generalize here, yeah. but uh, when our assets dropped to like 50 million in 2010, yeah. our typically said, oh my God, like, you know, you're going to have to start with, you know, high net worth individuals, then go to fund of funds, and then later maybe you can talk to pensions. Yeah. In our case, it was exactly the opposite. When we were the smallest, it was the biggest, uh, most sophisticated pensions that were allocating to us. And now that we're growing and we're over a billion, we're having you know more like fund of funds and high net worth individuals come and ask us questions. So definitely that these uh, these papers uh, created a common language and kind of addressed uh, the fear that some of these pensions had on their in their hedge fund portfolios and their in their equity portfolios. So expressing that in a in a clear uh, using a clear technical method was a uh, for us it was a necessity. It's like having a common language. If you don't have that, it's very difficult to communicate with your investors. But if what you're saying here now that you're actually uh, of a size and you're getting a different audience to come to you Correct. because maybe they are afraid that markets will at some point have a correction, even though I love the yeah. stats you give out every month and, and all the records that mm -hmm. that uh, that we can borrow because we don't, we're too lazy to research them ourselves, but you, you do all that work, so that, that's great. But but do you, do you think you have to now start explaining it to a different audience in a different way, yeah. or and and maybe we can try that today. If you were going to explain this to an individual investor, yeah. what exactly is it that you? Why should they even? Why should they consider you uh, to be part of their alternative portfolio? In in a sense, I mean. Yeah, I don't think I can explain that. Right? But I'll try. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good rehearsal, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so. The, the way to look at it is people are used to the market as something where the risk is visible. It goes up, it goes down. And then you try to remember when it went down, how much did it go down? Is it 5%, 10%, 50%? Typically, investors think of risk in those terms. Right. Now, what we're saying is the market has gone, has gone down or has had such little volatility. Yeah. At the same time, if it starts to go down... The market is going to go down substantially. It means if you look, if you look in the, this is not something which is visible in price. If you look at the uh, option pricing, uh, puts are priced at 20, 25 percent, 30 percent implied vols, where the calls are priced are seven, eight percent implied vol. So now, if you look at price, you have no idea what's going on. But effectively, if you look at the market in terms of the SKU index, for example, it'll tell you that if the market starts to go down, it's going to have a you know very very big move. So. The way I would explain that to uh, you know, a more high net worth individual is you can sell insurance, make money every month, and think that you're invested in a very, very high quality manager when you have not. All you've done is sold something where the risk of loss is very, very small, but then the size of the loss is going to be very large. Mm. right? So in terms of selling insurance and buying insurance or buying loto or selling to a loto, <laughs> Uh, investors actually do understand uh, that there's a cost of carry where people want the positive convexity in general. So we're uh, effectively we're saying that convexity is you have to think of it in terms of lotto tickets or in terms of selling insurance. Today, most financial assets look like they're selling insurance rather than being long 
what typically we refer to as equity beta. The risk in equity beta is very, very small. Yeah. Unmeasurable, I'm going to say. Yeah. So are you more, and when you do that, are you more taking taking up the case against You know, it's the convergent versus divergent uh, strategy. It's not so much actually against other CTAs. It's just the fact that most money, as we know, is actually invested in other strategies. It's not invested in trend following. It's not invested in managed futures. It's actually the fact that they have most of their current assets invested in strategies that may be much more risky than what they think. Mm -hmm. Correct. The risk is not measured. So CTAs have done the right thing for most investors. They've improved their Sharpe ratio by converting their positive convexity into, by, by combining risk on with risk off or convergence and divergence, they've improved their Sharpe ratio, but they probably will not provide as much uh, protection during equity corrections as a result. It's not a question that, uh, good or bad, it's just a question that investors should know where the sharp ratio is coming from and what is going to be the expected return in, a, in an equity crisis. So uh, that's critical and needs to be done across multiple time frames, right? So uh, CTAs are a great equity hedge, but today they will not provide protection if it's a relatively you know, uh, quick correction. If it's a two, three week correction, I would say CTAs will have a, a hard time providing. Of course. So it's just a question of transparency that convergence and divergence is different in, each, in different time frames. Right? So you can choose to be a divergent in the longer term time frame because that's still available today and it's not costly, but it's very difficult to be divergent in the shorter term time frames because mean reversion has been the driving factor when you look at short term moves. So, but in, if you explain that to investors, I think in, in my mind, they understand your returns better considering the market environment. And uh, I think you also gain clarity On your own process, you're able to trade convexity neutral in individual timeframes, in individual sectors. Rather than being momentum, you can say, I want to be long-short momentum. I want to be 130% long momentum and 30% short momentum. And I can say I can be momentum to mean reversion neutral in every time frame, in every sector, if I want. Right? So those type of decisions can only be made Uh, when you have enough clarity to look at it in, in a way that the risk is truly measured in terms of convexity, this is not available. So sometimes by trying to uh, please investors uh, in the short term, we're kind of uh, diminishing our long-term possibilities. So continuing with that, Nicole, Turning to the short-term space, yeah. um, we've seen that the short-term space has been challenging since, I think, since about 2010. It's been a it's been a rough space. Um, you're being very kind. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean, given that you're you're an expert in this space, what have you been doing to adapt to it? I mean, what's been happening? I mean, I would love to hear your views on that. So uh, the short-term index is flat since inception, or negative, actually down since inception uh, in 08. So. Yes, uh, challenging is a, you know, as I said, you're, you're being extremely gentle. <laughs> so now why are, uh, you know, short-term managers still getting an allocation? Because of diversification, but also because of convexity. If you're long a put on the market and it's going to cost you 10% a year, 15% a year, 20% a year, and you, you can get the same protection at 5% a year negative, uh, investors who are uh, pricing these things accurately will say, you know, great investment. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, luckily for us, we've been able to provide substantial alpha relative to the, uh, to the CTA indices, whether it's short-term or long-term. So in the short-term space, what's critical is the short-term space is much more easily crowded, right? When you're trading short-term, you're typically more uh, trading on stops and trading on stops intraday rather than VWAPing or trading market on open, market on close. So you're very sensitive to spikes in the market uh, up or down, and you're getting whipsawed much more if you have short-term noise. So what's critical uh, then to do is to have uh, the right filtering techniques. And of course, you want to buy cheap convexity and you want to sell expensive convexity, uh, realized, right, in the markets. But one way to do this is if everybody is trading a 10-day channel breakout, 
you want a short 10-day uh, channel breakout. It means you want to use 10-day. If you look at the short-term CTA index, you can have 70% correlation to it by trading 10-day channel breakout. I know uh, short-term CTAs are much more short-term than that, but 10-day channel breakout, I think, has 70 or 80% correlation. So this is kind of like the smart beta version of the short-term CTA index. You want to be shorting that and going long momentum around it. So if everybody wants to buy the S&P, nobody wants to buy uh, stock number 501, short the S&P and go long a small cap, right? It's kind of a typical arbitrage of equity long short. Same thing in the CTA space. You want to short smart beta and go long everything around it. In the short term space in particular, we're crowding, where markets, where you're highly affected by the liquidity of the market, this becomes very, very critical. So there's ways to trade mean reversion where it's kind of the lazy man is trading. So, uh, and you want to be, uh, try to find the, the positive convexity around it in the same way as I gave on, you know, on the S&P. Just curious, just maybe on a slightly different, different tact, you, you say, you bring up the word smart beta. Yeah. And of course, in our industry, and in particular in the trend following space, mm -hmm. it's been, uh, over the years, it's been, um, well, certain firms mm -hmm. promotes trend following as being a very easy risk premium to, to replicate. And so they sell their products very cheaply. Sure. Yet I have not really seen uh -huh. that these products have outperformed the true, you know, veterans in, in that particular uh, strategy. Sure. So, but so when you, so I'm just curious here. So when you say, but, but the, the smart beta products, some of them have raised billions of dollars, sure. you know, sure. interesting sure. because sure. people look at the fees and say, oh yeah, it's easy. So yeah. we shouldn't pay so much for it. Yeah. But so when you say you should short smart beta and do everything around it, I mean, how, how, what, what should you then do if, because I'm, I'm curious whether in fact that smart, if smart beta, and I'm, I'm referring it to trend following because it's yeah. easy yeah. for me to understand, right? I mean, is smart beta overrated in some in some ways that it's maybe not as effective in, as ca to capture that risk premium in in some ways? It's very effective when nobody has money in it. Right. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the issue with smart beta is that with transparency comes a certain amount of decay. So although you have multiple firms, you know, each firm is managing three, four, five billion in smart bet type of products or AQR is managing, I don't yeah. know, 15, 20 billion. Yeah. The, those return, the returns were great just prior to them raising the money. And typically, so take a, a, an AQR uh, replicator. Let's say you use 12 months momentum, six months momentum, three months momentum in combination. You end up with like 80, 85% correlation. But then you see that relative to that basic replicator, once they actually raised the assets, then they had substantial decay in performance relative to the, their own replicator. Right. So there's, um, what I'm trying to say is that there's, there's uh, although the, it seems that individual CTAs are trading one, two, three, four, five percent of volume or 10 percent of volume VWAP and very gentle and ma making, making markets, still markets are heavily influenced by, this, uh, by CTA trading. And at the points where liquidity is required, there's not that much liquidity. I mean, CTAs are a very big percentage of volume in the market. It's more easy. It's easier to see that trading short term. You say, like, how are my my assets influencing my slippage or that type of thing? And seeing what type of influence you have, we're trading one or two percent of volume, three percent of volume, but I think we still have impact. And analyzing the impact on short term, then going and applying the same techniques of analysis to longer term, you say the same exact thing is happening to long term trading, where you're running, you know, hundreds of billions. Yeah. So going back to smart beta, smart beta is great when nobody has money in it. The more assets come in, the more those specific entry points are going to be effectively, um, that those entry points or those techniques are going to become counter counterproductive. Yeah. So, Trend following works. I can give you that as a general statement, as a technique, because it captures something that individuals or investors don't want to do, which is right. trade, you know. Uh, they buy, want to, buy the high and sell the low, which is intuitively feels weird. Correct. Yeah. So the natural thing, human beings, whether you're in kindergarten, whether you're in high school, whether uh, you go to business school, everybody teaches you buy, buy low, sell high. Nobody wants to do the opposite. So that... Uh, psychological, those psychological biases are why trend following, which is a technique which is, I would say, cyclical in return, it's definitely not a straight line, 
sometimes works and sometimes does it. But when people believe in it, it stops working because the assets influence it. Mm. And I'm going to say this is a very, very big factor that uh, you cannot look at smart beta outside of this factor. And it's not that investors are coming in because there was a run in return. I, I don't believe it's purely a timing issue, like coming in in 2009. I believe that the assets coming into a strategy are actually having a major impact. Mm. That's my opinion based on what we see in the short-term space. And again, uh, applying the same things to long-term. And, and just staying with that a little bit, because now you're sort of talking a little bit about industry capacity and so on and so forth. But w w what about the short-term space in itself? I mean, where, where do you think that some of the techniques that you use you, you say 1% or 2% of volume, but even that you can see the footprint. I mean, where where is enough enough in, in, in your space, so to speak, not to end up in the same place as all the ones who've sold smart beta but are not yeah. delivering for their clients? So the death of channel breakout, uh, channel breakout is, you know, 50, you know buy, let's say the turtle system, uh, buy a 50-day high, sell a 50-day yeah. type of thing uh, with a shorter term stop loss, came when the model went public, late 90s, early 2000s. Those models had straight line equity curves and flat lined in the, in the 2000s. Then uh, longer term techniques, such as you know, typically used with moving averages, exponential moving averages, uh, flat lined later in 2009, right? So in the short term space, let's say things more similar to vol breakout, flat lined um, definitely since 2009 when the vol has been low, but they were with filtering. So not a, let's say the smart beta in short term was that long, long time ago. Right, right, right. <laughs> Uh, but using certain uh, types of filtering, you could still survive and make alpha. Then it became extremely, the more the vault compressed, the more difficult it became. So I would say short term, smart beta is dead, long dead. And as a matter of fact, you can trade against it, which is what uh, all those uh, mean reversion models that you see today are. are. Right. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.